most trauma therapies involve the body because trauma is that cutting of the link between body and mind. There's a disembodiment of numbing, That's right. right? However, the average person isn't particularly embodied anyway because we live in a sort of hypercognitive cerebral culture where the body is reduced to, as someone said, a brain taxi. Add a little bit of trauma to that maybe, we're numbed out and there's a cost to that numbing. Right. You know, our body isn't just a piece of meat. The body is a key part of who we yeah. are. Keep, it's a gateway to the soul if you want to be poetic. Mark Walsh, thanks so much for joining me on the Mark Divine Show. How are you today, sir? Pretty good. Enjoying relaxing in Portugal after some intense work. So nice to see you again, Mark. Yeah, you mentioned you were over in Ukraine. Tell us about that. You are doing some training over there? How are the folks over in that area? Yeah, I mean, the last I saw the team was a week ago in Krakow. Uh, the team uh, called Sen Ukraine. It's a charity I started last year in Ukraine. They do psychological trauma training. And um, this time uh, we decided to do the training in Poland. Constantly rushing to the bomb shelter is a little bit distracting for any training. So much nicer to <laughs> okay. do it in scenic tourist Krakow, which is more relaxing than the time before in Ukraine. So, um, yeah, nice to see the team. How are the, uh, what's the general attitude over there right now? How are people getting by? Are they, you know, well, it's, trying to normalize things or just give us a description of what it's like? Yeah, it's been a while. It's been 18 months since the invasion. Obviously, there's all kinds of people in all kinds of places. But, um, yeah, in a way, it's the new normal. And people sometimes are just exhausted from the constant fight or flight mm -hmm. just being in that environment. Uh, obviously, a lot of people have lost mm -hmm. loved ones. Pretty much everyone uh, I know uh, there knows someone who's died or you know, who's in immediate danger. Though it's different in different mm -hmm. cities, different places. Same working with refugees from there. You know, Some refugees kind of drove in their BMWs to Germany on the first day of the war. Some kind of got their houses bombed and had to walk to the border. You know? So it's very, people in very different situations. Right. That's amazing. And are they hungry for this type of uh, work that you're offering them, the embodied healing? Yeah, so my work as an embodiment trauma. teacher and trauma is one of the aspects of that. The Ukrainians very much see trauma healing, trauma education uh, as something Western, uh, as something intelligent and as something kind and most, most of all non-Russian. Um, so for them, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's very positive framing for them. They're like, yeah, well, this true. is something, you know, the West does. It's something Russia doesn't do. Therefore, we want to be aligned with the West. So therefore, this is a good thing. And I, mm -hmm. I think this is, in a way, the world's first trauma-informed war. Uh, in that normally what happens right. is yeah. there's, a, there's a war. Everyone gets traumatized. Everyone denies there's any trauma. And 20 or 30 years later, you know, with the NAM vets or whatever it is, the Gulf War vets, then people go, oh, hang on. We need to deal with this, but only after the alcoholism, domestic violence, you know, suicides. Mm -hmm, right. And in this case, it's really there from the beginning, and it has a very positive framing. So obviously, a, an ideal world would be no war, but um, a, a pretty good yeah. world would be one where people are at least informed of the consequences, and they're able to reach out for help when they need it. And, and who is the target for your work over there? I mean, you, you're actually working with military guys who are coming back from the front, or or just general civilians who are traumatized from the next, you know, air raid siren? Yeah, I mean, the team that I, I started it, but it's now run by local women and they do the training themselves now. You know, I'm a supervisor, I'm an advisor, a friend of the project now. They train, they've trained hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, for example, they've trained all the doctors and all the teachers and all the nurses in Lviv, which is one of the major cities and one of the big refugee Amazing. cities. They go to military bases regularly, they train children, they train anyone who's interested in trauma, which is pretty much everyone in Ukraine. And, you know, just incredible mm -hmm. young women who will stand in front of 200 soldiers and um, be able to uh, get across to them, which is amazing. So, you know, I'm very proud of them. Oh, that's incredible work. Wow. Thank you for doing that. That's cool. I'm, uh, it's amazing how much hunger there is for this. And you wouldn't think that in a war-torn area that folks would be even have the space to think, oh, I'm going to go get trained as a trauma therapist or body worker or whatever. I'm working uh, with this guy out of a group called the Conscious Coalition, and we're working in Sudan, helping out, you know, with um, um, first responders and others, you know, teaching them resiliency skills and and uh, coping mechanisms and, you know, that type of stuff. So it's not too dissimilar. It's right there. I mean, they're, they're dealing with it right now. But, you know, it's not like the, in the United States or I guess any country, COVID had a similar traumatic, traumatizing effect. And so... You know, if you think, well, oh, that's just for a war-torn area now. I mean, like, people are being traumatized daily with, you know, economic 
warfare and and the, you know the effects of the lockdowns from COVID, which are still you know people are still digging out of that mess. So everyone can benefit. What exactly are you doing over there? I mean, what what's what are you teaching the teachers, and what what specifically? tools or skills are you bringing to them? Yeah, so mostly what the team are teaching is trauma education. So you can't uh-huh. do, you can't train therapists quickly, but you can train trauma educators very quickly. And just knowing what mm-hmm. trauma is, is very helpful. Being able to put, signpost people to resources, being able to say, hey, these are the symptoms of trauma. This is what you might look out for. I remember I, I actually married a Ukrainian and this was some years ago. And just before my wedding, I was asked, my wife said, hey, come, my then fiance said, hey, can you, just before the wedding, can you come and talk to my hairdresser? Because he's been drafted into what was the first part of the Ukraine war. And I said, yeah, sure. So I turned up and there, and he's brought, you know, 30 of his friends. And they're, they're all traumatized. They've all had difficult experiences. Uh, some of them were captured, prisoners of war. And I, I thought, God, I've got an hour, because then I have to go pick up the rings, you know, like, like you know, I'm on a schedule there. Uh, and I thought, you know what, right. in an hour, what can I do? So I just said, look, this is my experience of working in various areas of conflict. This is my experience of what trauma can look like. You know, if you find yourself doing the following things, you're not crazy, but you might need help. And, you know, I talked through some of the symptoms of sort of sleeplessness or anger. You know, one of the guys is like, hey, why do I hit my kids now? I didn't used to hit my kids. Why do I get angry so easily? Someone else is like, hey, I can't make love to my wife. What's going on? And, you know, talk about how um, trauma can lead to dysfunction in various ways. Uh, dietary issues, alcohol issues, which, which can be common, um, particularly amongst, you know, ex-service personnel. And you can see the soldiers kind of nodding and nodding and going, okay, this guy gets it. And just from my demeanor, my embodiment, they could see like, okay, this guy is not, uh, you know, Northern Californian therapist who doesn't understand their world. Uh, they could see I've seen some right. life, let's say. And you're married to a Ukrainian. Which also yeah. helps. About to be married to an Ukrainian. Yeah, that also <laughs> helps. It gives me a, a way in. And I just said, okay, and here are the services locally you can go to. And, you know, here's a woman from the army that you might want to talk to. And because it would come from a guy and they were comfortable with that, then, you know, at the end of it, they were like hugging me and some were crying and saying, oh, thank you. I thought, thought I was going mad. And um, even just giving people the basics of what trauma is, is helpful. And then there's something right. called trauma first aid, which is what one might do in the immediate aftermath of an overwhelming experience that would mean one would be more likely to just have acute trauma rather than chronic trauma. Because most people have right. something traumatic happen in their life, particularly somewhere like Ukraine, but everywhere really there's, I think, 80% prevalence of traumatic incidents if you live in the UK, let alone if you live in Ukraine. So right. what do we do after, in the immediate aftermath of that so that it's less likely to get, you know, that fight or flight's less likely to get stuck in our system and become a more permanent problem? And right. there's a whole, a whole series of techniques called trauma first aid. So, for example, uh, some of the team were at the r- railway stations talking to refugees or advising soldiers on things they can do with each other and, you know, various techniques that can be used. I think that sounds very important, right? If you, you know, so, self-assess that you've been in a traumatic situation or you you know you observe something like what's the number one thing that that could be done either for self-care or for you know rendering aid well there's a few i mean move your body you know i was just advising some israeli friends for example mm-hmm. i'm like hey uh, in their case i was saying don't watch the news 24 7. that that's one yeah, uh, right. i was talking to israeli friends talking to ukrainian friends like hey staying still like i find that traumatizing here in the united states <laughs> right yeah i mean any news most of which is lies right it's i think we probably agree on the exactly. state of the news is perhaps not helpful but you know if you're seeing violations and awful things happening and of course you know it's good to be informed uh, but most of the ukrainians for example have got alerts set up on their phones which if there's a bomb coming immediately start beeping and you know, there's apps for it um, so they don't need to be watching the news all day long so things like limiting news exposure mm-hmm. moving the body after traumatic incidents Like even something as simple as, you know, you're in a car accident and, you know, the police might come and put a blanket around you and tell you to sit still and maybe your friend gives you a whiskey. And in fact, it might be better to just, you know, walk up and down a bit, you know, or go shake it off, you know, do some exercise, the gym that can be very helpful. Uh, Social support. So reaching out for social support, uh, particularly if you have access to people who aren't in that fight or flight or freeze mode. So, you know, I'm on the phone to some of my friends in the Middle East right now, and I'm able to, you know, just be a little bit of a, a voice of sanity and a, a nervous system that isn't right in the middle of it all. So the, yeah. the social support aspect's really critical too. And, and then there's other techniques. There's things like something called TRE, 
uh, there's tapping techniques, there's various sort of uh, mm -hmm. discharge yeah. techniques for that kind of energy in the body that gets uh, right. stored. What exactly is happening? You know, if in a traumatic incident happens, obviously I get triggered in a uh, fight or flight. Is it that I'm not allowing that to release and, and to, you know, to activate the, the opposite, you know, the rest and digest, and so then it just, what, it gets trapped in the body? Or yeah. what, what's happening? What's the mechanism? Yeah, there's different theories of this, and some people can go into the neuroscience, for example, much more intelligently than I can. I think there's a few ways to look at it. A pretty good way, a sort of basic way of, of I, I'll explain it to people is, you know, we all have that fight or flight, but there's, there's two things that can happen there. One is it can get kind of more stuck in the body is sometimes how people describe it. So instead of being agitated mm -hmm. and then calming down, you know, like my, you know, mm -hmm. if I look at my pulse now, I've got a pulse of like 80, which is, you know, pretty appropriate. You know, I'm doing an interview, I'm active, but yeah. I'm not stressed. Yeah. You know, I'm, that's like I've come down from some stress I had this morning. You know, your stress comes and goes, traumatic stress stays. Um, and there's, you know, various reasons for that, some of which is what we do, some of which seems very random, some of which is people's health and well being. You know, the, the, the different mm -hmm. risk factors that you can analyze out there as to why someone might get uh, more trauma and someone else just gets distressed and then comes down. And another way of thinking about it is people go from fight or flight into overwhelming stress and they go more into a freeze response. Um, which is a different neurology, right. you know, for example, people have studied this, uh, the polyvagal guys have theories on the different uh, strands of the vagus nerve, for example, involved in that. And that freeze response getting stuck in the system can look like uh, many things, but for example, it could look like digestive issues, different health issues. Uh, you'll see in Eastern Europe, you'll see a lot of reduced affect. So you'll see the sort of, mm -hmm. you've probably seen, you know, hot Russian or Ukrainian girls walking around with the sort of lack of smile. They're not really kind of engaged. You know, that's the soldier with the thousand yards there whose eyes are chronically tight. Mm -hmm. They might have chronic tightness in the body. And again, all the health issues associated with that. And unfortunately, part of that can be a reduction in kind of social engagement and empathy, which is why you do get mm -hmm. these cycles of hurt people hurting people. You do get these cycles mm -hmm. of trauma producing numbness, which can reduce empathy. Because while it's mm -hmm. in many ways uh, an understandable response to overwhelming uh, threat to shut down, unfortunately that shuts down the systems we need for parenting and marriage and just general right. social right. function. So some That's of right. those systems are dysfunctional. There are other ways of looking at another would be like it's almost like a memory disorder. Uh, so there's a way in mm -hmm. which the traumatic memory doesn't get stored as a normal long term memory. So there's a sort of a nounness. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a dangerous past mm -hmm. living in the present. Right. And I've, I've had this for myself from various countries and uh, to various levels. And, you know, people might know about dissociative flashbacks, which is the more extreme level. But, you know, you've probably got buddies who just constantly talk about their experiences in Afghan or in Iraq or whatever, because mm -hmm. they're still living there in a way. And like I remember my granddad, right. the day he died, was talking about World War II as if it was yesterday. It clearly hadn't totally got into wow. his kind of long-term memory. Right. And sometimes it's subtle. I remember one time I was um, in the gym working out and I had some kind of psoas release from a deep squat, which is a muscle associated with uh, traumatic memory. Yeah. And I, I just kind of like felt I was in Afghanistan for about a week. It was just like a subtle, almost like a smell or a subtle feeling that was just there. And um, yeah, it was a weird background feeling that just made me a lot more on edge than I normally would be in my hometown. Interesting. Wow. wow, man, you brought so much, uh, so many interesting points there. Um, I'm also curious how micro traumatic brain injuries could play a role, you know, especially with the military guys who are on the on the front line. It's even, you know, like, as a SEAL, you know, we have a lot of our SEAL team guys who are like seem perfectly normal, and all of a sudden they just go boom, right? They just lose it, and this happened in you know increasing numbers over the last few years, and. You know, and I think a lot of that's that you talked about the psychological trauma, but also there's physical trauma, like you see with the football players and soccer players and hockey players. And for, you know, military people, it's the, you know, even going to the range and shooting, right? If you're, if you're not using the protective ear protection and, you know, that you're getting that kind of ricochet and your brain mm -hmm. is just bouncing around in your head. And so I imagine that, you know, as we, you know, research these things a little more, you're going to find out that is a big factor as well. Yeah, it's interesting. So in, think? in World War I, when they first identified trauma, they identified it as shell shock because they thought it was from the physical That's shock right. of the shells. 
And then later on, they realized like, hey, no, this is um, psychological. And, you know, World War II, they called it combat fatigue. You know, PTSD was a Vietnam era terminology. Um, when they realized that uh, soldiers had a lot in common with um, people who had been abused by a spouse, they realized there was something similar. But what's interesting is in recent years, they've gone, oh, actually, the physical shock is potentially involved as well. So the World War I right. theory was not totally wrong, is what they found. I'm not an expert on that, but it looks like there's some research to say that there's, you know, vulnerabilities at least. And unfortunately, the Ukraine front lines are very reminiscent of World War One, and the, the, I the, uh, they're really they back moved in places like that. They're really horrific. And actually, we almost had to go back to the drawing board because I talked to a lot of the sort of American and British trauma experts, and they didn't really know how to deal with that kind of stuff because it just hasn't. Right. You know, that kind of war hasn't, hasn't been involved in for a while with massive loss of That's life, you know, guys losing their entire right. platoon kind of thing. And also just a constant feeling of powerlessness. I was talking to one British volunteer and he said, you know, being in a trench and trying to pull his helmet down over him as if he was like a turtle, you know, like trying to, and it, this feeling of just and compressing his spine and like this, the thing with trauma is it's most activated when there's nothing you can do hence torture right. rape and for soldiers my experience of talking to soldiers they most often get traumatized in two situations not when they're running around fighting it's when they're being shelled right. and they can't do anything or when they're watching a friend right. bleed out because again there's nothing they can do right, right? they're the two situations right. where people soldiers who normally feel quite empowered actually feel disempowered and there's a lot of that in, unfortunately in ukraine right. the sort of just you know, because if you're in your trench and if a shell hits you, there's nothing you can do. You know, if that's a direct hit, right. that's that's it. So, and you know that, you you can take precautions. But um, yeah, that's a that's a and Ukraine will be suffering and Russia too the impacts of trauma from this war for generations. Um, right. And we're already talking with the team about how to reintegrate soldiers, for example, because the reintegration issues right. are a huge, huge aspect for soldiers. Limb loss is another one that's huge there. So we had to kind of look at a lot of work on grief and look at kind of, you know, the grief of limb loss and how that is. It's been another big one. Yeah, this is, it's mind boggling, you know, that here we are in the 2023 and still fighting like barbarians at the gate. It's crazy. You know, I, I sometimes I have these moments where I'm with the team and they're just, you know, young women doing their best kind of thing. You know, they're, I, I basically went to the local university and said, right, I need, I need all your psychology students to train because I knew all the, the few therapists that existed. And there's some great ones like EMDR therapists I know um, yeah. who we were working with. They were like, you know, they're all super busy. And, you know, these young women, sometimes I want to say to them, like, look, we shouldn't have to do this. This is ridiculous in this, you know, 2023 that we have to do this. You know, and we do, so let's get on with it. But there's sometimes it's just a moment of, right. of crying or pulling my hair out and just going, what the actual, you know, excuse my language, Mark. You know, it's exactly. Like, like really, really seriously. Really, I, seriously? Like exactly. The, the worst of humanity in our current structure ascends to the highest power structures and have control over the most devastating weapons. Like, how do we get here? Well, it can only be answered probably spiritually. Now, I want to shift because, you know, we... I think the trauma work is, is so important, but I also know that, you know, it's not what you really do also like you embodiment work and the work you do in training coaches, um, you know, it can be used to heal from some extreme trauma, but it can also be used to, you know, evolve your consciousness, so to speak, right. To become more whole, more of a complete human being, let's just say. So let's talk about that side of your work. Like, mm -hmm. what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And what does embodiment even what mean, does it mean? you? And yeah. Yeah, what does it mean? Because, yeah. like, we are a body, and the body is the mind. And so how, do, how can we embody, how can we be more of what we already are? Yeah, it's, I mean, to make the link, most trauma therapies involve the body because trauma is that cutting of the link between body and mind. There's a disembodiment, a numbing, That's right? right? Um, however, right. yeah, however, the average person isn't particularly embodied anyway, because we live in a sort of hypercognitive cerebral culture where the body is reduced to, as someone said, a brain taxi. You know, most people aren't mm -hmm. physical. They're not moving. You know, I grew up working on farms. You're in your body a little bit more just from the elements and the labor. You know, uh, yeah. if you're running around as a seal, you're probably a bit more in your body. But it's um, most people are, you know, on their phones, on a computer. 
add a little bit of trauma to that, maybe we're numbed out. And there's a cost to that numbing. Right. You know, our body isn't just a piece of meat. The body is a key part of who we yeah. are. Keep, it's a gateway to the soul, if you want to be poetic. It's, uh, you know, I ask yeah. people, like, if I'm in a corporation, I'll say, where do you have your best ideas? And I, I say, let me guess. Let me guess. Listeners can play this game, you know. I'll say, you don't have them sitting at the computer. You have them when you're walking in, the, walking in nature. You might have them in the shower, maybe on the toilet. What do these things have in mm -hmm. common? Well, you're right. Einstein, all of his best ideas came while he was walking. Yeah, usually it's... Sometimes in his underwear. Usually it's you're moving, <laughs> you're in nature, because there's a degree of what we call eco-regulation right. to the body. You're either in good company, like dancing or making love, there's co-regulation. Uh, but nearly always you're relaxing, like in the shower, on the toilet, in your body. And it's like, because your mind just works better when you're in those situations. It doesn't work well when you're stressed out at a computer in traffic or whatever. Right. So the idea of embodiment is very practical in that it's, it's helping people think better. It's helping people communicate better. You know, so much of our communication is embodied. I mean, you know, I, it makes me laugh. I'm in a business and there's some guy who's getting paid 100 grand a year. And he's, you know, done an MBA from Oxford or Harvard or something. And he's just a head on a stick. And he's like, you know... <laughs> Hello, welcome exactly. to my company. I'm the inspiring CEO. And I'm and I'm like, okay, man, we need to get you at least moving. Let's give him some embodied practice. Let's or just I mean, just super stressed out. Like everybody I work with, God love them. They don't have to be in a war. They're just stressed. I mean, I remember when I was in my mm -hmm. first boardroom doing corporate stuff and I'd already done NGO work, nonprofit sector work in war zones. And I just remember thinking, God, this is the same embodiment this is the same you know this from your work mark right like yeah. people yeah, are so absolutely. stressed that they need some stress management tools and you, you can't really think your way out of that it's like you know if two guys are about to have a fight you can't just reason with them you know, excuse me gentlemen i think this is an unwise move you know this this is not going to work yeah. so you have to work directly with the body if you're interested in working with people the body is the quickest most effective access point and if you want to create lasting change, you have to work with the body because otherwise the body will just undermine mm -hmm. all your nice theories and books or whatever. I totally agree. Yeah, I, I recently developed a program and I ran it once. And I got a, it was a little too early for me to kind of put it out as a product, but I called it the exponential mindset. And I, and I talked about developing five minds. And the first mind is the body mind. So that's the point you just made is spot on. Like if the body is in hyperarousal, if the body is out of shape, overweight, you, you know, out of homeostasis in any way, then the brain is as well. And, and so your, your cognitive functions are going to be impaired. There's the right? foundational level of just kind of health, but it's right. also the That's foundation, right. say, of our emotional intelligence. Like where is empathy in right. the body? You know, are we tuned into our body to pick up on our intuition or the quality of rapport that right. we're in with someone? I mean, even as I said, like our cognition is, is based on that. And the lead as someone right. is, is embodied. And, you know, by that, I don't mean are they tall mm -hmm. or are they skinny? That's not so much about physical mm -hmm. fitness, though that's a good base. It's something else. It's, yeah, do they have the mm -hmm. qualities of a leader? And you know, you, I learned some of that through martial arts, for example. And it's not mm -hmm. taught academically. You can read a lot of good books right. and a lot of theories, but you know, does someone have it in their spine? Does someone have it in their muscle, their bones, their sinew? That's that's what it really comes down right. to. Yeah, that's the difference between knowledge and knowing, right? So you can, you know, use your martial arts example. You know, if, that's why you start out as a white belt, you know, and you work from ninth cue down to first cue, and you know, like going downhill. You're just packing knowledge in and you're starting to learn some basic movements, but you don't really start knowing until you're well into your, you know, first, second, third degree black belt, right? Because you're, you're embodying the movements. You're getting out of your head and just spontaneously acting, right? Shibumi, effortless perfection starts to flow, usually, you know, with long period of practice. But I think, you know, in the West, we're, we're so infatuated with knowledge and just packing more knowledge in and conceptual knowledge, you know, disembodied or disconnected from the knowingness of the body is not that useful in the long run. Well, it's good for a career as an academic, but not much else. <laughs> right, right. We've taken that academic model of knowing about things, and that's very different than knowing something, let alone being something. Right. 
right? So, right. you know, I could, uh, I just we talked about Portugal earlier, you know, like I could tell you about Portugal and you would know a bit more about Portugal, but that's different from, I don't know, the smell here, not what it is to, to hang out in a Portuguese bar and eat a pastel de nata. You know, there's a, there's a quality here. Mm -hmm. I mean, all leadership skills are not academic knowledge. I mean, you can explain mm -hmm. emotional yeah. intelligence very quickly, but how do you build it? For me, that yeah. level of being will either support or undermine anything we know. And it's, it's almost like our culture is obsessed. It, it misunderstands the verb to know and has become obsessed with knowing about things rather than knowing to right. do things or knowing to be things. And we, we even you know, right. don't respect the other kinds of knowing so much. You say, oh, he's just a tradesman. I'm like, okay, this is the guy who fixes your electricity yeah. or your plumbing. The master. Yeah, this is someone who really knows his art. So for me, like, if you're going to look at leadership seriously, or I work with a lot of coaches, for example, I help coaches, and it's like, again, it's not just cognitive. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. In fact, our work, we're calling it vertical leadership development because you know, it's probably a little misleading. It's inclusive embodiment. But it's a type of development that transcends who you were and gives you a new sense of self, self-concept that is, like I said, inclusive embodiment, new context, world-centric in your perspective, open-hearted, compassionate, caring. And those are all aspects of beingness that you just, like you said, you can't learn from a book. You just have to, it has to kind of emerge within you. And yet we know that there's certain practices and tools and, and uh, methods to find that emergence or to, or to activate that emergence. And I think that's what somatic work and embodiment practice is so valuable. And like I said, most, most people approach it in different ways. And I'm curious because I'm a, I'm a lifetime martial artist and a yogi myself. Movement has always been really, really important. And you mentioned movement, right, to release immediate acute trauma. How central is a somatic type practice like a martial art or yoga or dance or just you know being in nature to embodiment? Yeah, I mean, all my students have a meditation practice and a movement practice. And what that movement practice yeah. is, first of all, I say, look, something's better than nothing. Just moving your body is great. Yeah. Moving your body with awareness like yoga, conscious dance, martial arts, that's, just, that's even better than just going to the gym, which is still better than nothing. And then if we're going to be even more selective, we could say, okay, what qualities do you want to build? So, for example, first time I walked into an Aikido dojo, I was 18-year-old alcoholic from a you know, family of alcoholics. And I, something in me saw the discipline, the spine, the Japanese-ness, you know, the whole piece, culturally and embodiment wise mm -hmm. of, of Aikido and, and really spoke to my heart. And I was like, wow, this is going to save my life. And it did. Right. And for many years, Aikido was mm -hmm. practice, if not daily, several times a week. I was a live in Aikido student. And then after a while, I had, mm -hmm. you know, enough of that sort of warrior archetype. I'd kind of integrated that. And, you know, I think I, mm -hmm. I well, we were doing the Ukraine project. My driver was an Aikido friend called Pietra, a Polish Pete, who I was a live in Aikido student with. And we were doing that project and we were saying, you know, Mr. Smith, who was our teacher, Shahan Smith in England, a uh, student of Chiba Sensei and who was in the States before he died. Um, we said, look, he taught us the embodiment to do this, to deliver medical supplies right. and do trauma work in a war zone, right? right? Like, so it's like that right. way of being has you know, been with me now 25 years. But there was a point mm -hmm. where actually I realized that I was getting diminishing returns from doing Aikido. And that's when I started, yeah. like, I, for example, I took up tango dancing. I was like, okay, let's mm -hmm. time for music and women's perfume and fabulous shoes and you know, play and just like, <laughs> you're not going to find, you're not going to find that in a Japanese martial art. You know what I mean? Argentine women in high heels, you know? So I was yeah, variety, trying, variety is good. Yeah, build it. the range. So, you know, what you'll yeah. tend to find um, in martial artists or the same in yogis, conscious dancers, is they'll get very, very good at yeah. one thing and then maybe they could actually branch out a little bit. So if someone's a beginner, I'm just yeah. like, do any embodied practice. I completely if agree. someone's a bit more advanced, I'd say, okay, let's talk about what you're doing. Is it, you know, we send, we send the salsa dancer to kickboxing or whatever, the jiu-jitsu guy, just, you know, whatever. So it's, um, you know, I wrote, I wrote a whole book about this and um, it's, it's become one of my sort of specialisms as a coach is helping people design their own embodied practice. Oh, that's really cool. And I want to talk more about that, but it, it resonates with me because I, you know, I'm a lifetime martial artist, but I, I, I kind of like for the past three or four or five years, the, the more I 
I had a similar experience to you. Uh, the more I trained, the, the more I felt like I was um, intuitively that I was just like reinforcing something that didn't need to be reinforced anymore, right? And so I was like, oh, what is that? It's like, okay, so the, I got into the martial arts to develop my warrior archetype, right? And, and to really understand, right? What it meant to take a life and what it, uh, what it meant to not take a life. And, and then the practice of, you know, the martial art is a beautiful practice if you're doing it with the right intentions, right? If you're doing it to be the badass and to go out and play whack-a-mole, that's not the right intention. But when I got into yoga and I started practicing yoga and, and you know, one of the primary principles there is ahimsa, which is peace, which is not, it's not like conceptual. It begins to emerge in you through that practice, so I was beginning to experience peace and it was in conflict with, and even my last art is Aikido, even they, they call it the art of peace, it still was born in war and it's a violent program, right? So I finally said, you know what, I need to like stop doing martial arts now. I think I've, I've learned enough. And so I continue my yoga practice, but I, uh, to your point, um, really exploring other embodiment practices. And uh, so dance is one of them, I think that's really cool more time in nature back to some of my old like seal fit roots rucking with weight and you know what i mean in the ocean swimming so it's been a pretty cool experience yeah it sounds like you intuitively got to that and credit to you because a lot of people get very invested in what they do it becomes part of their persona and identity and being a beginner again for sure real. i remember being in my first you know i went to conscious dance which is like crazy hippie dancing and the martial artist in me was like, mm -hmm. where am I? What the hell am I doing? You know, there's a confront confrontation. <laughs> exactly. And now I love it. Now I love it. Contact improv and conscious dance and all these it's fun, hippie things. I love it. <clears throat> I, always, I have this, um, like this weird kind of discord, but I understand it now with my martial arts practice. I never was with a particular teacher or studio long enough to really move beyond, uh, you know, a showdown. So I've got like f four showdowns. Um, and so I always thought that was a kind of a, a problem or, you know, it was an unfortunate circumstance because, you know, there's a benefit for staying mm -hmm. in, you know, and you get your four. They, all, my, all my peers back at Sado Karate with Nakamura in New York are all six, seven dons. But what was nice about that is I had to be a white belt mm -hmm. four different times and start over. And now, of course, I had a lot of skills and, you know, I progressed pretty quickly, but I always had to empty my cup every time I, you know, right. moved somewhere or, you know, had to change my, I had two studios, you know, shut down because the teachers couldn't run them. It's interesting, but it taught me to empty my cup and to always think like a white belt. And it wasn't, you know, there's, there's an entrapment that can happen mm -hmm. just like in any kind of hierarchical structure when you're like, oh, I'm the sixth or I'm the seventh, you know, and you start to get the spiritual egoism or this, you know what I mean? Yeah, you my believe your shit doesn't stink. I remember going, you know, as a pretty competent Aikido black belt going into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu dojo for the first time. Because I was like, yeah, you know, Aikido's got some holes and there's some things I want to learn. I, you know, it's not very realistic in these ways. And my friend Rokas, actually, he did a whole YouTube channel about this journey from being, like, he's a Lithuanian guy, from being an Aikido black belt to um, uh, becoming an MMA guy. And there's, there's, a, it, there's a humbling. You know, I remember being choked out I maybe bet. 20 times on my first night on the mat. And I had to really, like two days later, to go back to class, I had to really like gear myself up, you know, and this, and then it, this humbling okay. that, and, you know, like I know parkour guys who can jump across buildings fearlessly, but they can't talk to a pretty woman, you know, it's like, you got to be able to transfer the skills or else, so what, who cares if you could do a wrist lock or jump across a building or who cares, you know, like, right. can you transfer it into your life is what I'm most interested in now. Now, I was going to say, if, if someone comes to you and, and after listening to this podcast and they say, hey, Mark, uh, I'm ready, how do you assess or help them understand kind of what, what kind of embodiment practice would be right for them? Yeah, I mean, people might turn up as a coach and they just want to learn a few coaching tools and you know, I can show them a few basic tools to work with the body, practical things like centering, which will be helpful as a coach. If they come to me as a yoga teacher or a dance teacher, that's very different, right? If they come to me right. as a soldier, that's very different. So it's really who's the person, you know, what's their level of experience with the body. With business guys, it's like, you have a body. This is, you know, sort of, you know, 101 and maybe let's do some stress management. You know, let's do some stuff on charisma and leadership because that's that might be helpful for you. You know, that's very different right. than someone in Ukraine or someone who's already a coach with a 10-year yoga practice, for example. 
I'd say increasingly right. now I get students who are already meditating. Well, I don't know how, what do you found, Mark? But mm -hmm. to me, loads more people are meditating yeah. than 25 years ago when I started this stuff, right? Oh, for sure. So that's great. Yeah. That already gives them a foundation of all. But, uh, but I find they're struggling with it. Yeah, often they've you know, got a lot, an, of, a lot of people have been. Yeah. They've got an app, maybe a light practice. They might not have done retreats. You know, it's, yeah. they're not necessarily. Right. And it, you know, meditation was never really meant to be removed from the whole Buddhist structure of ethics and wisdom and different traditions. But if, you know, if people have a basic meditation practice, that's helpful. And you know, often people have done a bit of yoga or a bit of martial arts now. I mean, my life's got a lot easier. Like I remember going in companies 20 years ago, people just going, what? You know, mindful what? You know. <laughs> and now they're like the HR manager's like, oh yeah, I do yoga and I've got a mindfulness app. And it, I don't know about you, but my That's life's right. got a lot easier. <laughs> That's pretty funny. You use the term embodied meditation in your book title. Yeah. Is that a specific practice? Uh, there's a few practices in that particular book. And I think the word mindfulness is a translation of a Pali word. And it's a very sort of 19th century British aristocratic translation that misses a lot of stuff. You know, so unfortunately, if you take sort of Western cognitive people, translate the word in a very cognitive way, and they yeah. extract it from a kind of cultural tradition, you will get a very cognitive practice. So a lot of meditation, mm -hmm. I think, is embodied, even if they don't use the word. It's, you know, it's a nice mm -hmm. word, but sometimes people need to come back to meditating as a body, with a body, and not just on a body. Sometimes I feel like a lot of modern mm -hmm. meditation is it's like how you would stare at a parking ticket, you know? It's just, just, <laughs> just like looking at your body from afar with disgust, and that's, that's right. probably not the best, best approach. No, I agree with that. One of my uh, yoga teachers, I did a, like a 500-hour training with him, said that that um, yoga was actually depth psychology, right? And, and what he meant by that is the, the way it was taught in the sutras and, and the, the Vedic tradition was that it was a, you know, it was a whole mind-body intuitive spiritual practice. And so Zen, like Zen is just the dharana, the concentration part of yoga, and mindfulness was just the, you know, kind of like the witnessing cognitive um, metacognition component, like learn how to separate from your thoughts and, and just sit there with them in non-attachment. And they were just two techniques that were kind of seized upon and then turned into entire systems. And so they've led to, you know, incomplete results. And I think that was very insightful for me. Nice, and you know, yoga can be done as a sort of narcissism practice. It can be done as exercise. Right. It can be done as deep body therapy, right. which really confronts the patterns. You know, we use it. Yeah. We have an embodied system. We teach yoga people where it's really, you know, we have poses that explore boundaries and generosity and eroticism and all you know different aspects of nice. being human that they can integrate into their yoga. Nice. Yeah, and the, you know, everything has a commercial aspect these days. But then there's also so, you know so many. You know, like you, I have a podcast, and I, I feel so lucky that I get to talk to just a lot of very cool practitioners, people mm -hmm. doing you know deep mm -hmm. stuff around the world. And we're in a pretty unique point in human history, even if it's crazy and the world's run by psychopaths. Uh, we're also in a point of human history where people can download podcasts and get information they would have had to That's travel right. to Tibet for. So it's um, right. you know it's 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 uniquely horrible in some ways. Uh, even the fact that we find it astounding that there's still war, that's, a, that's progress, that's an improvement. Right. The fact that we are disgusted by it and don't just think it's normal and okay. And that we have access to that's so right. many of these wisdom traditions uh, and the you know, soldiers in the UK, Ukraine, US, wherever. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, my sense is that everything's always in balance, right? So if, if there's an awful lot of awfulness, then there's an awful lot of goodness in the world to balance that out. Not, I think that's the way always things have always been, probably. Nice. Your book, uh, is this the recent book, Embodiment, Working with the Body and Training and Coaching? And Oh, so you have two books, and then the other is Embodied Meditation. Three, okay. three. So the first one is just called Embodiment. For What's the third? Uh, the basic one is called Embodiment. That's for complete beginners. You can read that on the toilet. It's very accessible. Uh, the second one <laughs> is more for like professional facilitators and coaches. That's you know published by the University Press. And the third one's just a little book on meditation. Uh, there are three, three books I have out just because, you know, you've got to have a book out, right, Mark? It's, it's the thing. Got to have a book out, yeah. And you've got the Embodiment Podcast. 
That's what I mean. You're doing so much great, great work. How can uh, um, folks find you? How do you like to engage with people? Is it email, social media? Yeah, books and podcasts, if they like that. If people want to ask me a question, the best is actually through my Instagram. I don't really email. but So if you put Mark Walsh okay. into Instagram or Mark Walsh Embodiment, you'll find me there. That's for questions. If they're short, I will always get back to people personally. And the main website is embodimentunlimited.com. And there's a load of free stuff there. So there's my first book, there's a free PDF yeah. for that, for example. If people you know, don't want to go to Amazon, they can download that there. Uh, embodimentunlimited.com. Nice. Loads of free resources there. What's next for you, Mark? You're going to go back to Ukraine? or I'm going to take adventure? a rest. I'm going to eat seafood on the beach for a week in Portugal. <laughs> and dance. Because yeah, da- maybe Dango. dance with the hippies <laughs> in the woods if I can. Uh, yeah, I need a rest, man. Like... Like I feel like there has to be a, a flow between giving and receiving, and nature's always yep. been a great healer for me personally. I, you know, I have a therapist, but often I'd rather be swimming in the sea than talking to him, frankly. So um, <laughs> that's that's my Fair that's enough, my I mean, too. therapeutic, slightly pagan plan for letting go of the trauma of the world is getting off the internet and swimming in the sea in Portugal. That sounds amazing. Well, enjoy. You deserve it. And thank you for uh, thank you for your work. Thank you for your time today, sir. Oh, you too, Marco. I think you're a kindred spirit, and I, I love the stuff you're putting out. So it's a real, real pleasure.